everyone, Blake here. So this is the third in our three-part series on getting started with ML agents from scratch. So uh, we've done our computer build. We have installed a lot of the tools that we need. Hopefully we got everything. Otherwise, we'll be doing some last minute installs here. Um, and now, as the third part, we are going to be downloading uh, Unity's ML agents and setting up a project and training one of their test scenarios. So uh, we're going to be doing that with the latest version, uh, which is uh, 0 0.10. So I've gone to the Unity Technologies uh, repo for this. This is on GitHub, so Unity Technology slash ML Agents. I'm not bothering with Git for now, so we're just going to go ahead and download that as a zip. So that'll download to this computer. Now, I also use Google Drive as a backup solution for my machine. Um, one of the downsides of some of these automated backup solutions is they'll lock a file as they upload it, and it kind of gets in your way. Um, and so I actually like to do a lot of my game development stuff kind of off of the automated backup areas so that um, I don't get held up by my backup software. Either that or I just turn off my backup software for a while. So I'm going to go to my C drive and I'm going to create a new folder for uh, ML agents. And I'm going to go into there and I should now have downloaded there it is, ML agents master and we're just going to go into there, grab everything and copy it over. And that's going to copy over super quick because this machine is ridiculously fast. Um, next step, we're going to go to the docs and we're going to find the installation guide. There it is. And all right, everything is copied over. OK. Um, actually, I'm going to. Yeah, I'm going to open up a command line. Right click, run as administrator. Yes. And I have the font size turned up on that so that people can see what's going on. Okay. All right. And we are here. Um, now there is a pip command. Let's see, so I've already cloned it. Um, let's see here. And we will pip install ML agents. So it's going to take it a couple seconds to work. The other thing is it's going to, we're going to use uh, this command, this uh, install dash e, to install everything in ML agents and ML agents environments. The value you specify depends on your Python version, and Windows will only go up to Python 3.6, and we are on 3.8. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do I am going to choco uninstall Python 3. And then see if I can get Python 3.6. Very specifically. This isn't going quite as well as we planned. Okay. Version 6.7. See how we do. Okay, so 
again, nice thing about Chocolaty, you can specify a version number um, so long as you know it's a valid version number and it'll just install that version. So again, big fan of this tool. Yes, I agree. 64-bit Python 3, good, that's exactly what we want there. So it doesn't work on 32-bit. I can't believe it doesn't work on the latest version of Python. TensorFlow has been known to lag behind a little bit, so I guess I shouldn't be super surprised. All right, um, pip install. Uh, you know what? It's been long enough since we were at that page. Cloned ML agents, no dash. And of course, pip is on the wrong version. So we're going to reopen a new command prompt so that the paths are new. So when we installed a new version of Python, that command window had all of the old paths instead of the new paths. Um, and so it um, wasn't going to work right with pip because it was aimed at the wrong version of Python. So now, uh, just by closing that window, reopening a new one, uh, it was pointing to the right version of Python. So uh, we should be up and running here. Now, I do know some people to help keep their different versions of Python straight uh, use a tool called Anaconda. I haven't had huge luck with it, um, so I don't use Conda. Uh, but again, uh, your mileage may vary. Your comfort with Python is going to vary. I'm not a super Python-y guy. Uh, I'm much more on the designing the environments side than I am on the building the network side. Um, but, um, you know, again, uh, choose the tools that are right for you. So, uh, you know, if you use Conda and stuff, great. All right, so there's TensorFlow. That's the big one that we were missing. Great. Um, and then we're going to get the pip3 install E. All right. Matplotlib. Jupyter stuff. Chugga, 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 chugga. Lots of tools. Lots and lots of tools. Um, okay. Let's see, TensorBoard doesn't like my setup tools version. Uh, that's okay, we don't need TensorBoard right off the bat, although I might install it anyway. Oh, this install does way more than it used to, actually. Um, Installs going on, CPU's like, yeah, whatever, 11%. No big deal. Okay. So that's busy doing that. Let's fire up a Unity. Uh, allow access, to the Unity Hub. Oop. There we go. Um, so we'll do a new project, and we're just going to stick with simple 3D projects, and we're going to do ML agents example, and I'm going to again put that in uh, off of the C drive so that my backup software doesn't pester it. 
Um, so, yep. Um, all right, so that goes there, that goes there, create. And this is done. Uh, again, Windows Security Alerts, just as you would be starting up. Okay, so ML Agent seems to be happy. Go into the ML Agents folder in the ML Agents folder, and then do that. try that and see if updating my setup tools is going to help. So from 39 to 42, that looks like that was it. Okay, so there's definitely an issue from a clean install that the setup tools were not what they needed to be. All right, so that's interesting information that we can actually make use of. Okay, so installing Python, it needed to be version 3.6. Once that's installed, uh, we needed to do the um, update of the setup tools, pip install-u, capital U, setup tools. Um, once we got those in, then the install-e, uh, those seem to work. Um, and then, um, or, yeah, and then pip install ML agents also works. So I would say Python 3.6 first, then uh, setup tools, then the ML agents, and then the uh, separate install scripts um, in these subfolders, right? The, uh, the install dashy -E commands. All right, well, so that was a little more work than we wanted, but it does seem to go. So um, we have a fresh clean project here, and I'm just gonna show that in Explorer and then go to the assets folder. Um, so this has, whoops, the scenes folder in that, and I'm going to open up another Windows Explorer and I'm going to go to C drive ML agents. And there should be, yes, the Unity SDK. And so this is where I'm actually going to go up a folder and I'm going to close the editor because we're bringing in the project settings. Um, and I'm going to just copy these two folders over. It's only going to take a second, and I am going to replace the files in the destination. So uh, there, we have new project settings, and then we have new assets, including the ML agents stuff. All right, I'm going to pop open my Unity project again. It's going to give me a mismatched version, right? So this was originally authored in 2017.4. We're running 2019.2. That is fine going to go ahead and continue. Last time I did this, that version conflict didn't matter at all. And it's going to take a second to import small assets. Um, so this importing process is something that Unity is actively working on speeding up. Um, so far it's, it can be a little arduous um, for really, really big projects, uh, but for a project of this size, it's not so bad just takes a couple seconds. There it goes. And now it's importing the art. So hold on. So some of these are shaders and JPEGs and stuff like that. All right, FBX, so model files. Here we go. And we are back up and running. So we're just gonna start with the ML agents um, we're going to use one of their examples, right? And 3D Ball is a classic one. 
and so find the scenes and we're just going to go with the easy version of the ball now there have been a couple of generations of this this is the latest and greatest um with a bunch of instances and cute little platforms instead of boring platforms um so one of the things you'll notice about this is that there are 12 of them and part of the reason why is um most of the time right now is spent in generating enough experience right so basically what you do is you have an environment you generate experience you do a bunch of stuff right and you see if that worked or not that's generating the experience and then after you generate a hunk of experience you go back and you say all right i'm going to update the policy which is my set of rules of how to play the game based on what i've learned right and so it's not constantly doing that it does a hunk of trying stuff out and recording what happened and then it goes through learns from all of that in one big chunk and then updates how it plays the game and then does that over and over and over again so uh, the updating by the way is often called back propagation because of the algorithms used to update the weights of the neural network so you'll generate experience do your back prop and then update the policy and do it again and so part of the thing is with 12 games playing at the same time you can generate 12 times the experiences uh, with a given policy this is also where having multiple instances of the program running which is why i have a computer with a bunch of processor cores um, is actually beneficial so that you can have uh, you know far more than even 12 things generating experience for you at once you can have uh, hundreds of experiences all running at once so you have a huge body of experience you can explore much more of the game and then learn it a big hunk and then do it again the gpu acceleration when we installed tensorflow and stuff we installed tensorflow cpu not gpu because the back propagation that's the only place where the gpu helps the actual machine learning process um, and in this case, you'll see that it's not actually going to be that big a part of the process. A lot more of the time is spent in the uh, generating of the experience. Now, over time, uh, as your projects get more and more complex, um, you may want to accelerate the back prop, or as your networks get huge, you may want to do that. But for a lot of projects, for things that go into games or simple reinforcement learning type stuff, CPU-based is actually just fine. Um, so we are going to uh, take a look at this real quick so we have our Academy um, and so we have our training configuration uh, our inference of training this is when we want to train the neural network inference is when we want to play it back and see what it does um, and then the reset parameters what is gravity mass um, the overall scale so these are set up on a uh, environment by environment basis right um so the 3d ball this guy has an agent um doesn't have a neural network model yet but there is a brain there ready to be trained so um we will go ahead and uh we need to fire up and another command prompt and we will go back to the ML agents folder. Um, we'll find, hmm, thought it was a train command, but you know what? Uh, I have been a couple of versions behind. We will see here on the install. We'll go back to the docs. Go back to the installation. Um, basic guide, fine. It's not in that document. I am just looking for ML agents dash learn instead of train. Okay. Um, now, so this command, ML agents learn, right? That's just the Python script to say, hey, go learn how to do this. It's going to use the default brain that somebody's already set up because it's a pre-canned example, right? Um, the trainer config path. So where is the config file? Um, it's probably in yeah config slash trainer config. Um, a run ID. That's whatever you want to call your run ID. I actually have a script that usually 
um, uses the scene name uh, for the run ID. I just find that helps make sure that I don't reuse run names, that kind of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this. Um, and that looks fine. And actually, I'll just use their first run name. And then this train command is what it actually says is, hey, do the back propagation, do the training. So I hit enter and it says, okay, TensorFlow, Unity, and then saying, hey, do you want to block features of Python? No, I'll allow it. Which makes me wonder if there's some kind of phone home stuff. It says you can now go by pressing play on the Unity editor. And so I'll come over here, hit play, and boom, we're training. Now, everything looks super fast and jittery, and that's absolutely right. When you're doing this kind of training, it speeds up the simulation to 100x. Um, and it's doing that because it can't, right? It wants to generate as much experience as quickly as possible. Now, um, if your environment uses a visual observation, where it's actually using little screenshots of your game, as opposed to just a vector observation where it's looking at the underlying model of your game, um, that it can't run at these high speeds, or at least uh, hasn't been in previous versions. I don't think they've changed it in this version. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to sit here and it's going to run and run and run and do that. And so we see that 45 seconds has elapsed. And then we should get um, a big pause at some point as it does backprop. Um, well, okay, on this computer, that was it. Um, backprop just happened. Um, it is not a big pause. <laughs> um, so you'll see everybody is running and then there's that pause that's like two seconds. Um, that's it running the back, back prop. And so you can see this reward is increasing and increasing and increasing. Um, and now the speed at which it's increasing also just jumped, right? So it was improving by one or two. Now it's improving uh, 10 points at a time. In this particular game, you have a maximum score of 100. Um, and so its ability to learn has just uh, dramatically uh, gone up. And you can see here that these guys... Uh, more and more stable. The balls are, are hanging on, on them longer. And so um, we're already, you know, we're less than two minutes into the training and we're at 80% um, effectiveness. So at this point, um, it's just going to get to uh, where it's going to perfect the game as best as it can. So a uh, big 10 point jumps here and then a couple of five point jumps and then there's going to be a little bit of back and forth as it cleans up and refines um, uh, its policies and so yeah it'll go down a little bit but it'll go back up yeah see there it went down and then boom way back up um, and so we're only at 16,000 I think this whole thing is set to train up to 50,000 uh, iterations and so as it gets towards an optimal policy, it's still going to try to experiment and whatnot. And so that's why the score goes down. Um, it's going to just kind of try different things to see if it can get super incredibly better. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's going to keep moving. And we're halfway through the training. Yeah, something like that. Um, and yeah, we're just at three minutes into it. And boom, there he goes. It, everybody got perfect scores already. Um, so it has basically learned this. Now, uh, at this point, it hasn't output the file yet. So you're going to see that um, C drive, ML agents. So we'll see that in the models folder. Here's first run. That's the one we're talking about. Um, there's nothing in here. That's because everything is still being processed and it's not st saving stuff along the way. Um, you can change some of the save intervals so that it'll save things along the way so that if you get the behavior that you're looking for, um, that you get it and you can um, you know, have different save points. But uh, in this case, it's set up to just um, run through uh, 50,000 iterations and then it will output the files here. So we're just going to hang out for another couple of minutes as this learns. 
Um, so again, we see there was some up and down and up and down, and now we're ending up pretty well up. Up, oh, no, we went down again. Um, again, experimenting. One of the other things that this particular algorithm, so this is using the proximal policy optimization algorithm, uh, it's designed to do a couple of things. One, it's designed to allow itself to forget and experiment a little bit, but not so much that it can't recover. Um, it's kind of baked into the algorithm. The other thing that it does is its willingness to experiment decreases uh, over time. So uh, it kind of has a simulated annealing type thing where it's really happy to experiment at the beginning of a run, um, but as it reaches the end of a run, it is less and less willing to do experimentation. And so uh, what you'll see is um, the size of the jumps will definitely uh, decrease, or they should decrease, uh, over time. Uh, so again, lots of experimentation got us to 78 instead of, you know, this great happy 99, 100 place, um, and then it'll recover. I have seen a couple of cases where it doesn't recover, but uh, by and large, PPO is a pretty solid algorithm. I've been able to use it for a bunch of stuff. Um, and so it almost always recovers. The other number to keep your eye on here is the standard deviation of reward. Uh, so that'll let you know, hey, how consistently are we doing this? So, you know, with this 100%, no standard deviation, like everybody got 100%, it was amazing, everybody did perfect. Um, yep, and we see that there, and we see that there. Um, uh, you know, in some of these other places, you'll see a couple do much better or much worse. So that standard deviation of reward is going to go up. Um, so again, as the PPO uh, goes through over time, um, that standard deviation of reward should decrease. Um, some of that is also going to depend on the randomness of your environment, right? This environment has a little bit of randomness, the starting position of the ball, the starting position of the block, um, and that's about it, right? If you have a really random environment um, where not all starting positions are created equal, then you may find that uh, you know your standard deviations of reward could be very, very large. So it's not a you know a number to live or die by where you, there's exact things that you should see there. Um, but it is one of those things that will help you understand if solutions are converging. And since this one, um, you know, has a maximum score, uh, it becomes very clear that yes, these have converged, right? So again, we've seen some good solutions and we're seeing the hundred more and more frequently as the system is less willing to experiment. And we are very close. This is it. This is the last iteration. Boom. Um, okay, it looked very happy with that. Uh, if we open up this folder, you'll see now in this uh, ML agents, there's the models, and for our first run, that was the name that we put in on the command line, um, there's this .nn file. This is our neural network file. So what we're going to do is we're going to find this 3D ball, um, and we're going to find, I want to open up that prefab. Uh, so I'm going to select the prefab root. Where are you? Um, you know what? That's right. New prefab stuff. Um, we will just open up the prefab. Here we go. And we can find the agent. And it's missing a neural network model. Well, we can bring this 3 dballnn into here. Just drop it in there. And yep, it's in the 3D ball folder. That's great. And we'll bring that over to where it says missing neural network model. Great. And we'll use the CPU as the inference device because we can just run it on CPU. That's fine. Now, since that was a prefab, if you don't know much about Unity and prefabs, I highly recommend you go learn. It should be that that is on all of them. Yep. Sure enough, it is. And now, when I just hit play, and we're going into... Oh, no, it thinks we're in training mode. Uh-oh. Oh, there it goes. Not detected that we're in inference mode. So now we're playing at normal speed, right? A uh, physics speed of one instead of a physics speed of 100x. And you can see these guys are balancing the balls on their head just fine. So 
Um, here we go. We are up and running and everything looks good. So we had a little bit of foibles with our Python version and our um, uh, some of our other tools. But once we got that settled and squared away, this machine is up and running and doing beautifully. So uh, I'm super stoked. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them here on the video or at the Patreon. Um, if you found value in this video, please hit like. Um, if you found value in a couple of these videos, think about that subscribe button. Um, and if you want to help direct the show and uh, some of the things that we do and just support the show, then I would be more than happy to welcome you to our Patreon crew. Links to all of that is going to be below. And in the meantime, I wish you good luck and happy learning.